The ancient Egyptians bequeathed a vast cultural heritage, including the Egyptian pyramids and the Sphinx. However, for many years, a lot about these edifices remained elusive, and researchers were only left to ponder with debatable theories. To decode these enigmas, renowned podcaster Joe Rogan invited guests to unveil secrets about the Egyptian Sphinx. What do these colossal edifices hide, and how ancient are they in reality? In this video, we'll journey with Joe Rogan and Dell Vintage to unveil startling facts about the Egyptian Sphinx. You might be aware that in 2021, after years of renovation, Egypt ceremoniously reopened the ancient Sphinx Avenue. It boasts over 1,000 statues of these mythical creatures. The ancient avenue, nearly 3 kilometers long and about 75 meters wide, once known as the Path of God, linked the Luxor Temple to the Karnak Temple situated further north along the Nile River. Zahi Hawass, an Egyptologist involved in the Sphinx Avenue's restoration from 2005 to 2011, hailed Luxor as the largest open-air museum, the grandest archaeological monument globally, narrating Egypt's history from the 20th century BCE, known as the 11th Dynasty, to the Roman era. However, another Sphinx draws much more attention, the Great Sphinx on the western bank of the Nile in Giza. If you're familiar with Joe Rogan, you'd agree he readily hosts guests whose viewpoints diverge from the mainstream. Thus, he invited Professor Robert Schock to discuss the genesis and age of the Great Sphinx. The expert Egyptologist provided evidence suggesting the Giza Sphinx is far older than conventionally believed, a claim not necessarily agreed upon by the entire scientific community. But what does this scientific community believe about this ancient edifice? The Sphinx, a creature from various cultures' mythology, was most commonly portrayed in ancient Egyptian art as a lion-bodied animal with a human head, typically a person of high rank such as a pharaoh. In ancient Egypt, the Sphinx served as a spiritual guardian and was often depicted as a man donning the pharaoh's headdress, much like the Great Sphinx. These creatures were often depicted and placed in tombs and temple complexes. The representations of sphinxes from Egypt migrated to Asia and Greece around the 15th to 16th centuries BCE. The Asian sphinx, unlike the Egyptian model, boasted magnificent eagle wings and was often presented in a feminine form, typically depicted crouching with one raised paw. In Greek mythology, the mythical sphinx also had wings and a serpent tail, legends depicted as a guardian that consumed travelers unable to solve its riddles. The name used by ancient Egyptians to refer to the Great Sphinx during its glory days remains unknown, as the term Sphinx is first mentioned in Greek mythology, approximately 2,000 years after the statue's construction. It's also unclear how ancient Egyptians perceived this magnificent statue. However, the statue gradually began to disappear into the desert at the Old Kingdom's end and was largely ignored for centuries. Inscriptions on the pink granite slab between the paws of the Great Sphinx recount the statue's liberation from the sands of time. Legend has it that Prince Tutmos, son of Amenhotep II, fell asleep near the Sphinx. He dreamt that the statue, calling itself Harmonkut, lamented its pitiful state and struck a deal with the young prince. If he helped the statue, it would reciprocate by helping him become a pharaoh. Upon ascending to the throne as Pharaoh Tutmos IV, he encouraged the worship of the Sphinx among his subjects. Statues, paintings, and reliefs of the figure sprouted throughout the country, and the Sphinx became a symbol of royal might and solar power. However, Tutmosis' efforts proved insufficient to save the Sphinx, and it was once again forgotten. Its body and face suffered erosion over time. While some narratives assert that Napoleon's troops damaged the statue's nose upon their arrival in Egypt in 1798, 18th century illustrations suggest the nose was already missing. More likely, it was deliberately destroyed by a Muslim Sufi in the 15th century, protesting idolatry. Parts of the royal cobra emblem on the Sphinx's headdress and the sacred beard also sustained damage, with the latter currently exhibited at the British Museum. Indeed, the Sphinx was entombed in sand up to its shoulders until the early 1800s. During that period, an adventurous Italian named Giovanni Battista Caviglia attempted to unearth the statue with a team of 160 individuals, but was unsuccessful. Subsequent efforts to unearth the statue were made by Augusta Mariette, a French archaeologist who managed to shift some of the sand enveloping the sculpture. He was succeeded by French archaeologist Emily Borchardt, who executed another significant excavation. However, it wasn't until the late 1930s that Egyptian archaeologist Selim Hassan completely liberated the creature from its sandy grave. 
Today, the Sphinx continues to degrade due to the effects of wind, humidity, and pollution. Restoration work has been ongoing since the mid-20th century, some of which has unfortunately been unsuccessful and has inadvertently caused further damage to the Sphinx. There is now no doubt that the Great Sphinx is remarkably ancient, a point even Robert Schalk agrees with. The only point of contention is exactly how old the statue is. The most widely accepted theory about the Great Sphinx suggests that it was constructed by Pharaoh Khafre, who ruled from approximately 2547 to 2521 BCE. In hieroglyphic inscriptions, it is posited that Khafre's father, Pharaoh Khufu, constructed the Great Pyramid, the oldest and largest of the three pyramids in Giza. When Khafre ascended to the throne, he ordered the construction of his own pyramid next to his father's. Though Khafre's pyramid was three meters shorter than the Great Pyramid, it was accompanied by more complexes that included the Great Sphinx and other statues. Traces of red pigment on the Sphinx's face suggest the statue might have once been painted. Given the structure of the pyramids and the Sphinx, some researchers propose that the Great Sphinx and the temple complex may have had a celestial purpose, facilitating the resurrection of the Pharaoh's soul through the alignment of solar and divine forces onto Khafre. There is additional evidence linking the Great Sphinx to Pharaoh Khafre and his temple complex. Firstly, the head and face of the Sphinx bear a striking resemblance to a life-size statue of Khafre that Augusta Mariette discovered in a nearby valley temple in the mid-19th century. Remnants of a processional road that connected the valley temple to the funerary temple near Khafre's pyramid were also found. Furthermore, in the 1980s, researchers posited that the limestone blocks used in the Sphinx Temple's walls were procured from the quarry surrounding the Great Statue. This implies that workers transported the blocks from the quarry to the Sphinx Temple when they were being removed from the Great Sphinx during its construction. Researchers estimated that it would have taken 100 people about three years to carve the Great Sphinx out of a single limestone mass. However, over the years, various other theories about the origin of the Great Sphinx have been proposed, most of which have been discredited by leading Egyptologists. Some theories propose that the Sphinx's face actually bears a resemblance to Khufu, suggesting that Khufu built the structure. Another theory posits that it depicts Pharaoh Jedifre, Khafre's older half-brother and another son of Khufu, who erected the statue in memory of his father. Other theories assert that the statue represents Amenemhat II, based on the style of the stripes found on the Sphinx's headdress. However, Robert Shook disagrees with all these theories. He shocked the world in the early 1990s by asserting that the Sphinx is several thousand years older than previously believed. Professor Robert Shock is a faculty member at the College of General Studies at Boston University. In 1983, he earned his PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale University. In 2014, Professor Schock was made an honorary professor at the Nikola Vaptsarov Naval Academy in Varna, Bulgaria, in recognition of his work on ancient civilizations. In 2017, he was appointed as the director of the Institute for the Study of the Origins of Civilization at Boston University. Schock's recent research has centered on cataclysms that ended the previous epoch of Earth, around 9,700 BCE, and simultaneously led to the downfall of advanced civilizations of that time. The compelling body of evidence gathered from various fields of knowledge, as presented in his book, Forgotten Civilization, indicates that potent solar flares were the cause of these cataclysms. Robert Schock first traveled to Egypt with John Anthony West in 1990, with the primary objective of studying the Great Sphinx from a geological perspective. Initially, he believed that the Egyptologists were correct in their dating, but soon discovered that the geological findings contradicted their claims. He quickly realized that something was amiss. All he had to do was look at the Sphinx. It's significant to note that his shock stemmed from a determination to prove West's theory of the Sphinx's date of appearance at Giza wrong. This discovery was made half a century ago by a lesser-known French scientist named René Schwaller de Lubitsch. Schwaller surveyed the Egyptian temple at Luxor from 1937 to 1952. The measurements he made and other detailed observations of the ruins revealed previously unknown geometric relationships, which were later confirmed by French archaeologists. Schwaller discovered similar relationships in other locations as well. In 1949, he reported his findings, and in 1957, he presented a more comprehensive report. The reviewer of the Journal of Near Eastern Studies urged his colleagues to take Schwaller's work seriously, 
as it challenges the notion of Egypt's insufficient mathematical literacy and provides a new perspective on Egyptian religious beliefs. However, Schwaller's work also ignited numerous disputes. Schwaller discovered a peculiar physical anomaly within the complex of the Giza pyramids. He noticed that the erosion on the Sphinx was significantly different from the erosion on other structures. He then hypothesized that the erosion on the Sphinx was caused by water, not windblown sand. At that time, no one understood the implications of this observation, and it remained virtually unnoticed until the 1970s, when independent Egyptologist John Anthony West raised the issue. John Anthony West juxtaposed the deterioration of the Sphinx, the temples, and the complex's walls with that of other structures across the Giza Plateau. The stones of the Sphinx and its surrounding walls displayed significant weathering, lending it an aged appearance. Rounded edges and deep crevices were noticeable, whereas other plateau structures mainly showed sharp traces of wind and sand erosion. Egypt saw millennia of plentiful rainfall during the post-glacial shift of the temperature climate zone northwards, a period from roughly 10,000 to 5,000 BCE. By its end, the Sahara transitioned from a lush savanna to a desert. Then, from around 4,000 to 3,000 BCE, a shorter but intense period of rainfall happened, ending by the third millennium BCE's midpoint. West hypothesized that the unique weathering patterns on the Sphinx complex were the result of post-glacial flooding, implying the Sphinx might have been carved during or even prior to this time. However, established archaeologists outrightly dismissed West's hypothesis. Nonetheless, West succeeded in persuading Schock to probe this matter in 1990, and they both found themselves in Giza in June that year. Schock noticed considerable erosion damage on the Sphinx's body, indentations that appeared after the Sphinx's body was sculpted from the bedrock. He deduced the only plausible cause could have been rain and water runoff. He also observed that the Sphinx is positioned on the Sahara Desert's edge, an area that's been relatively dry for the past five millennia. Furthermore, several structures confidently dated back to the Old Kingdom period show only signs of wind and sand erosion, unlike water erosion. Schock inferred that the Sphinx's oldest parts, known as the core body, must date back to a prior period, at least 5000 BCE, or even back to the end of the last ice age around 10,000 BCE, when the climate was vastly different and saw significant rainfall. Observers often query, could it not have been due to the Nile's flooding increase? However, geologically, this would demonstrate a vastly different pattern on the rock. It isn't an inundation from below, it's rainfall from above, as Robert Schock explained. Many disputed the idea of the Sphinx being so old, since its head distinctly dates back to the time of the Egyptian dynasties, which commenced no earlier than 3000 BCE. However, upon closer scrutiny, it's clear that the head is disproportionate to the body. Schock postulates that the existing head is not original. The original head would have weathered due to environmental conditions and erosion. During the Egyptian dynasties it was re-carved, which naturally decreased its size. In fact, it's even plausible that the original statue wasn't a sphinx at all. It could have been a lion, or based on recent findings, a lioness. Schock proposes that it originally represented a lion, and a human head, particularly Pharaoh Khafre's likeness, was added during his reign. The most probable cause of extensive weathering was a mix of factors, primarily chemical erosion, potentially due to rainwater containing high levels of corrosive compounds. Intense rainfall could have also played a part. However, according to numerous climatologists, the heavy rain period persisted until at least 2300 BCE. Its cessation might have been abrupt, coinciding with a severe climate regime change throughout the entire Mediterranean and Near East. That's all from me for now. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell. Your engagement is invaluable to me. Thanks for your attention and see you soon. Goodbye.